Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers by Dane Ortland. Chapter 9, An Advocate We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the Righteous. 1 John 2, 1 A closely related notion to intercession is that of advocacy. The two ideas overlap, but there is a slightly different nuance to the Greek words underlying each. Intercession has the idea of mediating between two parties, bringing them together. Advocacy is similar, but has the idea of aligning oneself with another. An intercessor stands between two parties. An advocate doesn't simply stand in between the two parties, but steps over and joins the one party as he approaches the other. Jesus is not only an intercessor, but an advocate. And like intercession, advocacy is a neglected teaching in the church today and it flows straight from the depths of Christ's very heart. Bunyan wrote a book on Hebrews 7.25, the key text for Christ's heavenly intercession. He also wrote one on 1 John 2.1, the key text for Christ's heavenly advocacy, which reads, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the Righteous. The New Testament's message of grace is not morally indifferent. The gospel calls us to leave sin. John explicitly says that he wrote this letter so that his readers may not sin. And if that was the sole message of the letter, that would be a valid and appropriate summons. But it would crush us. We need not only exhortation, but liberation. We need not only Christ as a king, but Christ as a friend not only over us, but next to us. And that's what the rest of the verse gives us. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The Greek word translated in 1 John 2, 1 as advocate, parakletos, is used five times in the New Testament. The other four are all found in the Upper Room Discourse in John 14-16, to each time referring to the ministry of the Holy Spirit after Jesus ascends to heaven, 14-16-26, 15-26-16-7. It's difficult to capture the meaning of parkletos with just one English word. The difficulty is reflected in the diversity of translations, including helper, ESV, NKJV, GNB, NASB, advocate, NIV, NET, Counselor, CSB, RSV, Comforter, KJV, and Companion, CEB. Many of these translations contain a textual footnote giving alternate renderings, reflecting the difficulty of capturing parakletos with one English word. The idea is that of someone who appears on behalf of another. Perhaps advocate comes closest of all our English words in expressing the role of a parakletos. Early theologians such as Tertullian and Augustine, writing in Latin, frequently translated parakletos in the New Testament with advocatus. The text of 1 John goes on immediately to say that Jesus is also the propitiation for our sins, 1 John 2.2. Jesus as our propitiation means that he assuages or turns away the just wrath of the Father toward our sins. It is a legal term, an objective one. Christ as our advocate may have a faint legal connection, but more frequently in literature outside the New Testament in early times, it has to do with someone, something more subjective, expressing deep solidarity. Jesus shares with us in our actual experience. He feels what we feel. He draws near, and he speaks up longingly on our behalf. Who is this advocate for? The text tells us. Anyone. The only qualification needed is desire. When will we receive this advocacy? The text tells us. It does not say we will have an advocate, but we have an advocate. All those in Christ have, right now, someone speaking on their behalf. Why is this advocate able to help us? The text tells us. He is righteous. He and he alone. We are unrighteous. He is righteous. 
Even our best repenting of our sin is itself plagued with more sin, needing more forgiveness. To come to the Father without an advocate is hopeless. To be allied with an advocate, one who came and sought me out rather than waiting for me to come to him, one who is righteous in all the ways I am not, this is calm and confidence before the Father. Let's look more deeply at the difference between Christ's intercession and his advocacy by noting the difference between Hebrews 7.25 and 1 John 2.1. Hebrews 7.25 says that Christ always lives to make intercession for us, whereas 1 John 2.1 says, If anyone does sin, we have an advocate. Do you see the difference? Intercession is something Christ is always doing, while advocacy is something he does as occasion calls for it. Apparently, he, inter- he intercedes for us, given our general sinfulness. But he advocates for us in the case of specific sins. Bunyan explains it like this. Christ, as priest, goes before, and Christ, as an advocate, comes after. Christ, as priest, continually intercedes. Christ, as advocate, in case of great transgressions, pleads. Christ, as priest, has need to act always, but Christ as advocate sometimes only. Christ as priest acts in times of peace, but Christ as advocate in times of broils, turmoils, and sharp contentions. Wherefore, Christ as advocate is, as I may call him, a reserve, and his time is then to arise, to stand up and plead, when his own are clothed with some filthy sin, that of late they have fallen into. Note the personal nature of Christ's advocacy. It is not a static part of his work. His advocacy rears up when occasion requires it. The Bible nowhere teaches that once we have been savingly united with Christ, we will find grievous sins to be a thing of the past. On the contrary, it is our regenerate state that has more deeply sensitized us to the impro impropriety of our sins. Our sins feel far more sinful after we have become believers than before. And it's not only our felt perception of our sinfulness, we do indeed continue to sin after becoming believers. Sometimes we sin big sins, and that's when and that's what Christ's advocacy is for. It's God it's God's way of encouraging us not to throw in the towel. Yes, we fail Christ as his disciples. But his advocacy on our behalf rises higher than our sins. His advocacy speaks louder than our failures. All is taken care of. When you sin, remember your legal standing before God because of the work of Christ. But remember also your advocate before God because of the heart of Christ. He rises up and defends your cause based on the merits of his own sufferings and death. Your salvation is not merely a matter of a saving formula, but a saving person. When you sin, His strength of resolve rises all the higher. When his brothers and sisters fail and stumble, he advocates on their behalf because it is who he is. He cannot bear to leave us alone to fend for ourselves. Consider your own life. How do you think about Jesus' attitude toward that dark pocket of your life that only you know? The overdependence upon alcohol, the lost temper time and again, the shady business about your finances, the inveterate people pleasing that looks to others like niceness, but which you know to be fear of man, the entrenched resentment that bursts out in behind the back accusations, the habitual use of pornography. Who is Jesus? in those moments of spiritual blankness. Not, who is he once you conquer that sin, but who is he Who is he in the midst of it? The Apostle John says, he stands up and defies all accusers. Satan had the first word, but Christ the last, wrote Bunyan. Satan must be speechless after a plea of our advocate. Jesus is our paraclete, our comforting defender, the one nearer than we know, and his heart is such that he stands and speaks in our defense when we sin, not after we get over it. In that sense, his advocacy is itself our conquering of it. We we are indeed called to forsake our sins, and no healthy Christian would suggest otherwise. 
When we choose to sin, we forsake our true identity as a child of God. We invite misery into our lives and we displease our Heavenly Father. We are called to mature into deeper levels of personal holiness as we walk with the Lord, truer consecration, new vistas of obedience. But when we don't, when we choose to sin, though we forsake our true identity, our Savior does not forsake us. These are the very moments when His heart erupts on our behalf in renewed advocacy in heaven with a resounding defense that silences all accusations, astonishes the angels, and celebrates the Father's embrace of us in spite of all our messiness. What kind of Christian does this doctrine create? Fallen humans are natural self-advocates. It flows out of us, self-exonerating, self-defending. We do not need to teach young children to make excuses when they are caught misbehaving. There is a natural, built-in mechanism that immediately kicks into gear to explain why it wasn't really their fault. Our fallen hearts intuitively manufacture reasons that our case is not really that bad. The fall is manifested not only in our sinning, but in our response to our sinning. We minimize, we excuse, we explain away. In short, we speak even if only in our hearts, in our defense. We advocate for ourselves. What if we never needed to advocate for ourselves because another had undertaken to do so? What if that advocate knew exhaustively just how fallen we are, and yet at the same time was able to make a better defense for us than we ever could? No blame shifting or excuses, the way our self-advocacies tend to operate, but perfectly just, pointing to all sufficient, pointing to his all-sufficient sacrifice and sufferings on the cross in our place. We would be free, free of the need to defend ourselves, to bolster our sense of worth through self-contribution, to quietly parade before others our virtues in painful subconscious awareness of our inferiorities and weaknesses. We can leave our case to be made by Christ, the only righteous one. Bunyan put it Bunyan puts it best. Christ gave for us the price of blood, but that is not all. Christ as a captain has conquered death and the grave for us, but that is not all. Christ as a priest intercedes for us in heaven, but that is not all. Sin is still in us and with us and mixes itself with whatever we do, whether what we do be religious or civil, for not only our prayers and our sermons, our hearings and our preaching, but our houses, our shops, our trades, our beds are all polluted with sin. Nor does the devil, our night and day adversary, forbear to tell our bad deeds to our Father, urging that we might forever be disinherited for this. But what should we now do? If we had not an advocate, yes, if we had not one who would plead, yes, if we had not one that could prevail and that would faithfully execute that office for us, why, we must die. But since we are rescued by him, let us, as to ourselves, lay our hand upon our mouth and be silent. Do not minimize your sin or excuse it away. Raise no defense. Simply take it to the one who is already at the right hand of the Father, advocating for you on the basis of his own wounds. Let your own unrighteousness, in all your darkness and despair, drive you to Jesus Christ, the righteous, in all his brightness and sufficiency. If you enjoy this recording and are able, please consider purchasing a copy of this book and give it away to someone else so that they might be blessed. Thank you.